Now, the moment of truth. Put the battery in. Battery's in. You know, I gotta build it first before I can show you that it works. Howdy, everybody. This is Steve, KM9G. Today, we're gonna build the QRP Guys power meter, SWR meter, and dummy load. This thing does a whole lot of stuff for a very little price. There'll be links in the description down below for where all this thing goes. Right now, what I am doing is sorting out all of the parts, trying to figure out what happens. And I like this little cheat sheet here that I make. What I'll do is I'll take all of the components and I will tape them out onto a piece of paper and then I will identify which ones they are because sometimes those color codes, color bands on the resistors don't make sense. Sometimes they do. But also I need to know that I have all of the right pieces before I get started because otherwise I'm going to spend two and a half hours building a kit only to find out that I'm missing the last piece to make it work. That's a pain in the butt. All right, looks like we got most of the pieces here. Checking out all the other stuff that I'm not gonna tape down, the big stuff that's fairly obvious. And we got it all. Let's get to work here. All right, I have my side cutters. And what I do is I cut these pieces off of the reel just to make it easier. You can pull them out, you can cut them off, it doesn't matter. You have plenty of extra leg length left in place here. So nothing to worry about. So I run my soldering iron at 640 degrees Fahrenheit. It depends on what the project is. Sometimes you might need a little bit more, sometimes you might need a little bit less. The key is to get the solder flowing, and if the solder doesn't flow, then you know you need to add some more heat or you're doing something wrong. In this case, this project has a pretty big ground plane, and sometimes that sucks away a lot of the heat of the soldering iron. So sometimes you need to turn it up. We'll turn it up a little bit later. I'm just putting all the resistors in now. You want to start with the lowest components, the lowest profile components, the ones that are closest to the board so that they don't make the board rock too much and they don't get in the way. If I was to put the BNC connectors on first, which are the tallest profile components as an example, then the board would rock every single time. These were kind of funny. I think I almost lost one of these. And this is kind of an interesting design. I don't know. There is probably a fantastic reason, and it could be any number of reasons. Everything is always a compromise, but I don't know why this wasn't a resistor array as opposed to a series of individual resistors. They all went straight in a line anyway, and it was pretty neat to find that out and stick them on, and the, the practice is fine. The kit's fantastic. It does the thing. Not complaining, just wondering. and then just zip these all down. I put a little bit of solder on the tip of the iron. That helps to take the, the flat part of the tip, and if I don't get it perfectly flat with the circuit board, it helps to fill up the space and transfer the heat a little bit better. This is rosin core or flux core solder, so there's some flux built into it, so that also helps transfer the heat and make things flow a little bit better. What's next? Oh, diodes. Diodes are directional, and on the diode there is a stripe, and on the board there is a stripe. Make sure the stripes line up and you're good to go on diodes. I have also been told that diodes are kind of sensitive to heat, and so I don't dwell a lot with a soldering iron. Just try and get in with a quick dab and get back out, which is probably just the right amount of caution for these things, and I'm overthinking everything anyway, so we just get after it. Next up is the capacitors. These capacitors were spaced differently than the holes on the circuit board. So I had to do a little bit of work to get them to fit in. And that's where the pliers come into play is shaping the legs properly and getting them in there. And you don't have to, but why not? Just makes it look a little bit better. These are four big resistors. These resistors make up your dummy load. They're basically designed to absorb heat. And so we'll feel them get a little bit warm. In the instruction manual, it says space them off of the board a little bit to give them some breathing room. So I used one of the discards from the capacitors. And then I figured out, you know, if I put this with the leg part up, it's going to chunk, 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 chunk on the way out. So I put the leg part down. 
gave it enough space and seems to have done the job for me. Just a little shim. And then it slid right out. So, <laughs> big thumbs up. Good idea. So this is the chip socket. There's a variety of ways to put chip sockets in. They make this stuff called glue tack or they make um, you know masking tape that you can tape it down with. What I like to do is I like to put just one pin in with just enough solder to hold it in place. And then I'll come back after getting it arranged in my hand and I'll warm up the solder and let the piece slide into place. And then it'll hold itself while I do the rest of the legs. And the same thing with these switches. The two connections on the end of the switch are ground connections, but they're also the things that are giving you the most physical security to hold it in place. So there's some extra solder that you want to put in there to make sure that the switch doesn't move around a lot. And then this was a tactile switch. This switch can only go in one direction. If you try to put it in the other way, the whole spacing is off. So they're designed to make it easier for you. My coin cell battery holder, the the one leg, the one lead off the battery was out of the holder when I got it. So I put that back in, no big deal. And then the long leg on the capacitor is the positive side. It's identified in the instruction manual and it's written on the board. So make sure that the long leg li lines up with the plus sign on the board. And they want you to lay this one down so that it has a nice profile when you put it together. And then this is the SWR bridge. There's 12 windings on each side of this binocular toroid. And I wasn't really sure how I was gonna go about doing this. So I spent some time getting the wire straightened out, measured out 20 inches on my desk mat here that you see, and then thought about it for a minute and just figured I'd do it. I can, I can always undo or redo it later. And it turned out that it worked okay. So each time I go through, the center is one pass and then I count out with my fingers. So one, two, three, four, you'll see me count. And that's just to keep track of things. And it wasn't, it wasn't terribly difficult. And at the end of the project, if I use 20 inches on both sides and I wind up with two equal legs coming out on the top and two equal legs coming out on the bottom, then I'm pretty sure I've got the right number. So just a, just an ounce of prevention there works out pretty well for you. And they give you plenty of magnet wire, so you can probably even screw this up twice and still have plenty left over to get the job done. Now what am I going to do with the extra magnet wire? I guess I'll have to make like a QRP bandpass filter or something. And I found that it was best to pull the wire through, fold it over once, and then that helps you keep it nice and snug as you go on. They recommend that you melt off the enamel on the outside of the wire before you put it onto the board. I didn't really see how I was gonna be talented enough to make that happen, so I shoved all the wire through and then I burnt the enamel wire off here with the soldering iron and then cut it back and, you know, fingers crossed it works. So we'll do all four of those connections. Two of them match up at the same hole and then two of them cross over. Get that cleared away. And I filled up one of the holes by accident. So we'll use some solder wick to pull that out. And then I get out my multimeter and I check for continuity. So I'm checking to make sure that the power transfers through the core. And then I'm also checking to make sure that one connection farther away also is contiguous with the other, the other ones. Just I don't know, just hoping to see that I did a good job. This part here was a particular pain in the ass. I suggest that you just fiddle with it because that's what I did. This took the longest out of the entire project was trying to figure out how to get these wires in place and, and whatnot. And I don't think the length of the wire is terribly important. The shorter, the better for who knows. But I tried to do a little bit of pre-tinning on the wire so that the stranded edge of the wire had some strength to it and use my pliers to kind of gently persuade it through and pulled it through the board and soldered it down and maybe some extra heat to burn off some extra insulation if it was necessary. But in the end, I just fiddled with it enough and got the job done. So I, I believe in you. I know you can do it. On this one here, I just shoved the whole thing through insulation and all and then 
tried to pull it off with, you know, cutting the insulation with the Stanley knife and then pulled it back a little bit to get it in place. And it worked. It does the thing. Let's check it out. Multimeter, continuity mode, check a couple of points, check a couple of distant points. Everything's good. And we go at it again because you got to do it twice. And if any of this is moving too fast for you, go down to the bottom of the screen. There's a little gear. You can click on that, and then you can slow it down. I don't want to waste your time if this is something obvious to you, but at the same point, you have the ability to slow it down. So trying to be respectful of everybody. There you go. Told you it took a long time. That's at 6x speed, just to give you an idea. This is the uh, seven segment display. It only goes in one way, so you can't mess that up. I had to straighten the legs out a little bit. That's fairly normal. And then we solder them home and clip the extra leads off at the end. Same trick, put it in, tack it down, make sure it's flush and nice before you put all of the pins on and then go back and put all the pins on. BNC connectors. So there are two little tiny leads that are your antenna connection, and then there are two big leads that are the ground side of your antenna connection for sure, but also are the physical strain relief impact takers. And so they take a little bit more because there's more metal there to, to heat up. And you want to give them a little bit of extra solder to make sure that they stay in place. These were the tools that I used. Soldering iron, utility knife, Stanley knife to be precise, small pair of pliers, flush cutters, and wire strippers. That was it. All right, so now the moment of truth. Put the battery in, somehow. Battery's in, on switch on, and it lit up and, and did something. Okay, so we need a radio. We're on the radio. I'm gonna switch this into AM mode. Let's turn the volume down on that. AM mode puts out a carrier. So I have this set to load over here, and let's see what it does. One. Oh, it's telling me one SWR. Let's turn it over to power. So obviously a dummy load should be one to one SWR, so let's do power this time. And it's telling me 3.6, 3.5. I can believe that. Okay, let's go to CW. Key. Three point seven, and it's in. It's in CW mode. It's set for five watts, and we are in paddle, I believe. Let's do key, key type auto write, manual. Three point six seven or so. Okay. And they're getting a little warm. It's doing the thing. Three point seven. Okay, now let's compare this to something. Okay, we have the X sixty one hundred plugged into the MFJ eight forty nine, and the MFJ eight forty nine is plugged into a dummy load. So let's try it out. Four point two power out. Let's switch modes to AM. And four point ten. 4.10 out. Not bad. So the two of them are, are fairly close in agreement. Fantastic. The thing works. I love it. This is great. You've got to get one of these things if you are a tinkerer or you're going to be playing around with low power QRP type radios. 
a couple of real quick things to address here. Why were the numbers different between this SWR meter and the MFJ849? They kind of address this in the documentation. The short answer is because this is affordable. This is cheap, quote unquote, and so you get the results that you get. That's not why I got this. I got this for a couple of reasons. One was to build the kit because I love building kits. And the second one was because I wanted something with a little bit more fine grained answers and a little more resolution, if you will. The true answer is to go spend thousands of dollars and get a bird and all the right slugs and the right cables and make sure everything's tested and calibrated and certified and so forth. Maybe get a really good high quality oscilloscope and test and verify and blah, 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 all that stuff. Or you can get something like this or something like the MFJ849. And what I really want to know is on the radios that I'm going to be testing. In this case, it's going to be the QDX, which is the QRP Labs FT8 transceiver. I need to go and tune that for more power. On a meter that is reading a QRP signal at 5 watts with an error rate of 5%, I can't tell if I've made an adjustment. So I wanted something with a little bit finer resolution. This may or may not be it, and if this isn't it, we will find out when we get to that video. So that's what's coming up next on the channel is performance tuning for the QDX to get the most amount of power out of it, and this is gonna help. In the meantime, there's a video right over here I think you will enjoy next. Thanks for being awesome. I'll be over there waiting for you.